Good morning, it's uh, Jeremy. It's Thursday, May the 14th, lockdown Thursday, and it's freezing outside. It's like winter. Today I want to talk about OFDM, which stands for Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. It's a telecommunications technology which is used uh, pretty well everywhere now. Uh, typical applications might be in digital shortwave broadcasting, DRM. It's used on cable television systems, discrete multitone. It's used in 4G, it's used in uh, LTE, it's used in 5G. Uh, it's used pretty well everywhere. And the idea, idea behind OFDM, let's say you have a given restricted channel bandwidth and you want to cram as many bits per through that bandwidth. What you can do, for instance, is you can have, let's say, a QAM signal or a QPS signal and taking up the whole channel and um, you put all your, basically your bits in one basket now what happens in that channel, let's say for instance if you get uh, some form of multipath, uh, you can have a selective fade within the channel so a portion of that spectrum gets screwed up. Now if you just have one carrier taking up the whole bandwidth then you'll lose everything. In OFDM what you do is you split your data up into many many parallel channels. So let's say a selective fade goes through it knocks out part of the channel, your data can be split in such a way or coded in such a way that uh, only that portion is lost and the rest of it gets through. So that's kind of the idea behind OFDM. If we uh, look at, uh, let's say, the history of OFDM, in a sense it's nothing new. Uh, if you go back to the, uh, let's say, the 1800s when we started with electronic communication with telegraphs, um, when uh, Morse uh, used his Morse code and telegraph systems uh, expanded all over the planet, and essentially when you think about it, that was the first internet. Um, generally the telegraph system uh, needed space to run the wires so a telegraph system consisted of basically a battery um, a couple of wires and a key a key would put current on the line at the transmitter and at the receive end what you would have is you would have a magnet with some form of a sounder so when the key closed current would flow down the wire to the sounder the magnet would pull the uh, the magnet will pull the sounder down it would make a clicking noise. So that's basically the telegraph. Now you could have two wires or you could basically have a um, one wire and a ground return. Uh, in the 80s I worked on a telecom system in Southeast Asia and there was a telegraph system parallel to the railway where we were working and uh, that system was put in by the Dutch in the 1800s and a hundred years later the system was still working well. It was one single galvanized steel or iron galvanized wire and uh, the return path was actually the ground, which is fairly wet, it was a tropical country. And they had uh, Leiden jars for batteries and the system worked really well. So here is actually, uh, this is uh, my Morse code key that I used in 1966 to get my ham license. I learned how to tap Morse code here. So I've got a little telegraph system set up here. So I'm sending a CQ there. So those were the first systems. Basically, you had DC current flowing through a wire. Now the next thing that happened after that is people said, well, hold it now, we've got a cable. Maybe we could get more signals on that wire. So that kind of led to um, the voice frequency telegraph idea. And the idea behind that is you have uh, several tones within the uh, cable bandwidth. Um, let's say the cable bandwidth was, let's say, anywhere from, you know, a couple of, uh, let's say, 10, 100 hertz all the way out to, let's say, uh, I don't know, you could probably go to 10 kilohertz, but typically the voice bandwidth, let's say, 300 to, to 4,000 hertz. So what you would do is you would put in a bunch of tones in there, space them accordingly, and then you would use frequency shift keying on each particular tone. So the idea rapidly took... Um, uh, took place and uh, voice frequency telegraphy um, came about so then you can get many telegraph signals on making use of the full bandwidth of a wire rather than just a DC current pulsing through so that's the idea of frequency division multiplexing where you've got a bunch of signals sitting on top of one another. Uh, fast forward uh, to the um, first microwave systems, first microwave systems uh, point to point replaced huge long telephone networks um, so you could go, let's say, every 30 miles, you could put a microwave station and that linked uh, telephony across North America. And in the microwave systems, what you would do is you would uh, stack the voice channels one on top of the other. So typically you'd have a 4 kilohertz voice channel. And the first systems are, let's say, 600 channels, and they went up to 960 channels and 1,200 channels. And 
Before the advent of fiber optic cables, basically the analog uh, radios, microwave radios, were up to 2,700 channels. So you'd have 2,700 channels of 4 kilohertz. And in that 4 kilohertz, you could stick either a voice, a voice uh, signal, or you could have, for instance, uh, voice telegraphy in there. You could have a bunch of data signals in your voice channel. So that's kind of the history of frequency division multiplexing. Now, the key to OFDM is the principle of orthogonality. And the idea of orthogonality is that if you multiply two tones together and you integrate them over a certain interval, then that product, uh, that integral product, definite integral, is zero. So if you think about, let's say, for instance, in Fourier analysis, if you integrate over zero to two pi, uh, let's say if you integrate sine omega t and sine 2 omega t, then those tones are orthogonal. If you have two sines at the same frequency multiplied together, then what happens is you get the cosine of the sum and the difference. So basically, uh, you end up with a DC voltage of 0 0.5 and um, a tone at double the frequency. Now, in OFDN, what we do is we uh, pick a specific integral for our, or a specific inter interval for our integration. So we're going to space our carriers by a frequency spa spacing, let's say delta f, and that delta f is going to be equal to uh, 1 over the uh, baud time. So for instance, if you want your particular um, carrier to carry, let's say, 100 baud, Okay, so 1 over 100 would be uh, 10 milliseconds, and you would space your carriers by 100 hertz. So if you, if you do it that way, then you can be assured that the integral, um, the definite integral is zero. So let's look at a model here. Here's a model that I use for orthogonality testing. So there's one sign, there's a second sign. I multiply them together, and I go into an integrator. So there's my integrator. This interval here is going to be the baud time for that particular carrier. Um, I'm going to integrate uh, over that baud time. At the end of the baud time, I'm going to reset the integrator. Um, I'm going to multiply this by 2 divided by the baud time. The reason I do this is that um, if you don't uh, multiply by uh, the baud time, then the, the product of the uh, definite integration is very, very small. So multiple, if this is, if you multiply the sine of one frequency by the same frequency, you're going to get a DC voltage of 0 0.5 coming out of this. You multiply it by 2, you get 1 uh, times TS, and the TS is cancel out. So basically, if you see the same tone in there, you're going to get 1 coming out of here. Now, the tone's going to have various amplitudes depending on the I and Q components. So if the I was 4, you'll have 4 coming out of here. So that's why I set it up like that. In the context, I'm going to start off with, let's say, uh, 200 times 300. Okay, so 200 times 300, they're spaced by 100 hertz. Okay, and if I define my uh, baud time to be 1 over that spacing, in other words, 10 milliseconds, then they should be orthogonal. So let's run that and see what happens. Okay, so there is, what we're seeing here, there's tone 1 at uh, 200 hertz. There's tone 3. Uh, sorry, tone 2 at uh, 300 hertz. That's the product of the two tones, and this is the integration. So the integrator starts off. It gets a certain area under the curve. Now, this is one cycle. So after uh, 10 milliseconds, which is there, uh, what do you see? Then the integration has gone to zero. Okay, so they're orthogonal. Now, let's pick, um, let's pick a different tone here. So let's say 200, let's say 275. Okay. So my spacing is 100 hertz, but my, my, my tones are not spaced by 100 hertz, they're spaced by 75. So this won't be orthogonal. So if I run this, let's see what happens now. Okay, so there's my 200, there's my 275. Now at the end of uh, that particular cycle, Notice that we're sitting up here. This is not zero. So at the end of the next cycle, we're sitting down here when it resets, so we're not at zero. So you can see clearly that these tones are not orthogonal. Okay, so that's a way to test for orthogonality.
Let's go back to our blog post here. Okay, now uh, another thing we can look at, so in the blog post here I put in the uh, orthogonality, uh, orthogonality tester, there's the the product of 200 and 300, you can see it goes to zero there, and there's the product of 200 and 275, uh, and you can see that um, it's not orthogonal. Another way to look at this, if you look at a, um, a QAM signal, in the previous blog post, incidentally, I covered um, 16 QAM, 32 and 64 QAM. So if you want to go back to the previous blog post, I can show you uh, how you build QAM and the various properties. You might want to do this before you listen to this particular post. Uh, but there's a QAM signal, so the main lobe is there. That's the carrier frequency. Now the null, the first null is at 1 over the baud rate. So let's say the baud rate was 100 baud's per second. So this null here would be 100 hertz uh, away from here or one over the baud rate. So if this is 10 milliseconds, that would be 100 hertz. So that's what a QAM signal looks like. Now in OFDM, what we do is we stack the carriers one on top of the other. So there's my first carrier at FC. So what happens is for the second carrier, its first null, if we make the spacing one over T baud, its first null is sitting under the peak of this carrier. So basically the spectrums are overlapping, but they're orthogonal. And we'll see that in a minute. We can pull those signals out. So that's uh, the principle of orthogonality. So what I'm doing here in this, in this post is I'm just hypothetically saying, hey, wouldn't it be neat to have um, an OFDM system for an amateur radio uh, transceiver? So if you look at an amateur radio transceiver, all the digi modes work with uh, the uh, USB uh, interface with, a, let's say, a single sideband transceiver. So if you look at the USB interface, it goes from 300 to 2700 hertz. Okay, so that's the bandwidth we have to play with. So let's say we stick our OFDM signal in there. Now the center frequency here is going to be 1500, and I've got 2400 hertz to play with. So let's start off and say, hey, let's, let's make an 8-channel OFDM system. Okay, so if I have, let's say I'm using 16 QAM. Okay, that means 16 QAM is 2 to the 4th, gives you 16. So I've got 4 bits per baud. Okay, so eight channels. I'm going to number them from zero to seven. Uh, let's say my system bit rate is 9,600 bits per second. Now later on we're going to look at, let's say, what's the maximum number of bits? What's the capacity of this USB channel in terms of the Shannon limit? And depending on your signal-to-noise ratio, something like 12 kilobits per second. So that's the best theoretically you could ever do with anything, with any modulation technique, no matter what you invented. According to Shannon, you're never going to cram through more than, let's say, about 12 kilobits per second. So let's say we say our data rate is 9,600 bits per second. We're going to use 16 QAM. And let's say I spa space my carriers by 300 hertz. So that'll be the baud time. Okay, so my first carrier is going to be at 300, the next one at 600, 900, 1200, 1500, 1800, 2100, and 2400. So those are my carriers. That's my spacing, 300 hertz. Now the baud time, if uh, the spacing is 300 hertz, one over that, like 1,000 milliseconds divided that is 3.3 .3 milliseconds. So that's the baud time. So for each one of those carriers, if you take 9600 and divide it by 8, you get 1,200 bits per second per carrier and 4 bits per baud. So that means my baud rate is 300 hertz. So that works out. So let's look at uh, a Psychos model. So what I've done here is I've got, those are my first four channels, and those are my next four channels. So I've got eight channels here. I'm adding them all together. Now each one of these channels is a 16, it's a super block. So I open up, let's say, channel five. This is a super block that gives you 16 QAM. So in my previous post, I discuss how you build this. But basically what I'm doing is each one of these generators, I'm feeding with a random integer, integer generator. This will generate an integer from 0 to 15, okay, because there's 16 levels. It'll go into here. This block gives you uh, the equivalent for each one of these states from 0 to 15. It'll give you an I value and a Q value. That'll be the amplitude of the I comp component. <coughs> Excuse me. There'll be four different amplitudes and four different amplitudes of Q. I think it's minus 3, minus 1, 1, and 3, something like that. Okay, and then you multiply that I by cosine and sine by Q. 
All right, so that's the super block. So those, those are my eight channels of 16 QAM. Um, for the simulation, I initially put in a sideband filter, but I took it out. And the reason being is that this thing's going to add some delay and it's going to screw up my receiver. I didn't want to do that. So it's in here. I guess in a practical system, you'd want the SSB filter in there, but I just, uh, uh, I bypassed it in, internally. It's just bypassed right now. So the output goes to a fast Fourier transform spectrum analyzer, a scope. <clears throat> I also save my output so I can input it into the receiver later to analyze. So let's run this and see what happens. So what we're seeing here, this is the output. This particular graph here is one of the super blocks, super block five, so channel five, it's just showing you this is the output of the random integer generator. So from zero, various numbers up to 15. And these are the various numbers for I and Q. So you can see I, for instance, it goes from three, one, minus one, three. So those are the four values of I and the same thing for Q. This, uh, this here is a spectrum of the OFDM for the A channel. Notice that it's kind of a flat top. Uh, there's sort of an industry jargon. They talk about a Bart head. You know, Bart Simpson has that kind of uh, crew cut. So that's that's what they call a Bart head. So those are your A channels. And this is the, uh, it's this stuff is like say 20 dB down. These are the uh, other products of the spectrum. But those that's where your, your information is. The sideband filter, of course, or your digital filter can get rid of all of that before you transmit it. And notice that this is the uh, this is the output of the OFDM. Now, one problem with OFDM is it's got a if the average value, let's say, is down here, it's got a huge <coughs> peak to average value. So, if you're going to put this uh, OFDM signal into an amplifier, the amplifier has to be very linear because this is the type of signal an amplifier would hate. So, typically, you'd have an amplifier with a certain gain, and you'd back it off quite a bit to make sure it was ultra linear. Okay, so that's how we generate the O A channel OFDM. Let's look at our receiver now. So what we do in the receiver here is we take the we read the uh, 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 in the transmitter there I saved the output into a vector called or, or a matrix called A. So I'm reading in the matrix A again. So that's basically the signal from the transmitter. And here I'm just looking at channel five. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to resurrect my I and Q components. I'm going to multiply this eight channel signal by uh, omega five so the frequency from channel five <coughs> cosine and sine all the other components when multiplied by this will give you zero because they're orthogonal i'm only going to get out channel five times channel five that'll give me half a volt dc and what in my integrator remember i said that i had two over ts so i'm going to have let's say for a three volt i signal coming out of here i'm going to have three volts coming out i'm going to sample and hold that and that'll be my I signal. So let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so this is my I signal here. This is the output of the integrator before it goes into the sample and hold. So if, if you expand this here a little bit, you'll see the operation of the sample and hold. Okay, so this is my I signal. It doesn't start till here. There's a delay because I'm waiting till um, I'm waiting basically one TB before I sample at the end of the period. So there's the output of the uh, integrator. It's building up to certain values, and just before it resets, I sample it. So that's the sample and hold. <coughs> so if you look at this signal here, I and Q, and compare it to the transmitter, I and Q, you'll see that it's exactly the same thing. So basically, that's my receiver then. It works on the principle of orthogonality. I sample and hold and get back my original signal. All right, now, that's all fine and good. So there we are in the blog post. That's my transmitter. That's my receiver. And there's my resurrected I and Q. And that's the generator, uh, integer generator. And you'll see that that's the same as, uh, sorry, that's the transmitter. Down there, there's a receiver, and you'll see that that and that from the receiver are the same as this and this. Now, let's think about this again. This was an eight-channel system. Now, the problem with the eight-channel system was the baud time was 3.3 milliseconds. 
Now that's not, uh, if you're talking about, let's consider, we're talking about an SSB transceiver for ham use. Let's consider um, we're got, we've got the best possible skip off the F2 layer. Let's say the virtual height of the F2 layer is 325 kilometers. So what's the maximum distance we can go? Well, let's say we have a takeoff angle of zero degrees. The maximum propagation distance is 1,121 kilometers for one single hop. So that's the maximum distance between the two points. The maximum propagation distance, since you're going at uh, 325 kilometers up, is 1320 kilometers. So if you work that out, it's 4.4 milliseconds. So basically one, one hop on the F2 path is 4.4 milliseconds. But if we had an eight channel system, hold it, that's only 3.3 milliseconds. So what happens if there's any multipaths? It's gonna completely screw up your signal and you won't be able to regenerate it. So what we really wanna do is we wanna go for a higher channel system where we can increase our baud time. So for instance, let's say we went to 150 baud instead of 300 baud. That would mean we would have a baud time of 6.7 milliseconds, but we'd have to have a 16 channel system. Uh, if we went down to 18.75 baud, look at this, we could have 53.3 milliseconds, so it's much bigger than 4.4 uh, milliseconds. And basically we could have a 128 channel 16 QAM system. So what I've done here is, since this is 128 channel, this would be very difficult to build in Psychos. You could actually, you could make many, many super blocks and you could build it. But if you look in the literature, uh, reference three and four, reference three is, is my favorite textbook um, by uh, Professor Couch. He's at uh, Florida State University. And reference four is another great book by Simon Haken at McMaster University. And they have detailed descriptions in there of OFDM and how you can use the inverse Fourier, fast Fourier transform to build an OFDM uh, signal. So that's a much more efficient way. And that's how, that's how they basically do it these days, is they build the OFDM using the inverse Fourier. Um, in figures 11 and 12, what I've got is um, the GNU radio companion model for 128 channel system. So I'm using the OFDM modulator and I'm using a random uh, random source here and I'm going into basically an FFT just to show you what it looks like. So uh, this plot here is the random data going into the OFDM modulator. You can set up the OFDM modulator for different types of modulation on each channel. I've set it up for 16 QAM and I set it up for 128 channels. So what you see here is you see a spectrum going from minus 1.2 to 1.2 kilohertz. So that's basically a bandwidth of 2.4 kilohertz. And you've got the BART head here and you've got 128 channels. So what you would do with this particular spectrum, uh, this IFFT spectrum, is you just knock it up to the middle of your SSB bandwidth. So this thing right now is centered at zero hertz. So using DSP, you would, you would uh, translate this spectrum up to 1500 hertz. So you'd be 1.2 kilohertz down and 1.2 kilohertz up to make use of the full 2400, um, uh, 2400 hertz bandwidth within the SSB USB. So that basically what we've seen then in this, in this particular post is we looked at OFDM, the history, the principle of orthogonality, a simple eight channel system for a ham, hypothetical ham radio implementation, and how that would probably not be good because of the uh, baud time being too small, and how you could increase the baud time uh, to a respectable value by using uh, more channels.